You know, last year, for a 24-hour um, news cycle, we saw pictures in slow motion of the Prime Minister of Australia on her way to an official event taking a tumble. I mean, we saw it on every station in slow motion, speeded up every way. So I thought that this morning I would outdo the Prime Minister. And, and I took not one, but two tumbles right there, and where were the paparazzi? <laughs> Only those who were there saw it. The rest of you didn't get a chance to see that I can outdo the Prime Minister of Australia. <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to thank Nick and Litiana, Pastor Faye, Gebir and his team, all of you who have gathered here. I hope I don't miss anyone because you all have meant so much to us. You've just made it so incredibly wonderful for, for Simona, Pastor Simona and myself to be here, especially Pastor Darren Parker. He has been a great host to us, and we just want to thank you for that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for all the worship we've done this morning. Now we want to hear a word. For this we came, please do not disappoint us, especially the speaker, because I want to be changed so that I too can be a world changer. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me and open your Bible so that we can read the scripture? Open your Bibles to Lamentations, chapter 3. That's our Old Testament lesson. Lamentations, chapter 3. Verses 21 to 24. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Lamentations 3. When you have it, say amen. amen. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. And now to our New Testament passage in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. My sermon title is Your Time Has Come. And I need you to say this to those who are in front or behind, to your left and to your right, say, your time has come. <laughs> now say it like you mean it before you sit down. Your time has come. And now please be seated. One of my favorite preachers recently told this story. He said that one day he was walking down 42nd Street in New York City and he saw a well-dressed man sitting on the sidewalk across the street and this man looked like he had fallen and hurt himself and so he decided to cross over to see if he could help him. And as he began to cross the street, he realized that he thought that he recognized the man. And when he came up close to him, he realized that he recognized him. 
And it was none other than the devil, Satan, that old serpent, that, uh, that dragon of old. And so he went up to Satan and he said to him, devil, what on earth are you doing here? What are you doing sitting here like this with your, your face in your hands and shaking your head from side to side? You're usually everywhere breaking up marriages, corrupting governments, accusing the brethren. What are you doing sitting here like this? After a pregnant pause, said he, the devil responded woefully. You see, nobody is resisting me anymore. They're not resisting me like they used to. And as a result, I have nothing to do. So everything is going my way. This is what the devil is thinking. And sometimes when we look around at our world, it seems as if everything is going the devil's way. When you think of the global economy that has been brought to its knees by the greed of a few over the need of many, I would say that everything's going the devil's way on our planet where thousands of children every day are snatched from their beds or on their way to school to be viciously raped, used as sex slaves in pornographic pictures to satisfy the, the perverted passions of adults who discard and murder them and toss them aside like they're trash. I would say that everything's going the devil's way on earth where last year nature convulsed causing the earth to vomit up its inhabitants through unprecedented numbers of violent tropical tornadoes, category two hurricanes, powerful floods, earthquakes, and tsunamis that have taken the lives of millions along with billions of dollars of property damage. Wouldn't you agree with me that it seems as if everything is going the devil's way? It seems so in our church and world where more than 50% of all the people who get married also get divorced. 30%, 34% of, un, of unwed teens have at least one pregnancy before turning 20 and untold numbers of abortions are performed annually. America rates number two on the list of all nations in, in abortions being performed, second only behind Russia, to satisfy, to protect the, and cover up the result of lust and loose living. You see, the reason why all of this is happening is because self-denial ethic has morphed into self-fulfilled ethos as people listen and respond to their own emotional needs which they want fulfilled immediately without waiting, without sacrifice. And we see that attitude and that mood is taking over our churches. Everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, as far as the eye can see, Evil abounds, and it's getting even more aggressive every day. So I want to know what you who accept the mantle of world changers, I want to know what are you going to do about this pervasive presence of evil. I want to know what you're going to do. Are you going to leave this conference where you were taken up in, into to the mountaintop in worship? Did, wasn't this the singing and, and everything so fantastic? We were taken to the mountaintop in worship. Are you going to just go home and sit in your comfortable congregations and keep silent about evil? Are you going to retreat into pretentious prayer 
pretentious piety and join others in their puny prayers with those who act as if God's love protects us, makes us immune to the evil and the suffering of those around us? Are you going to just continue weeping individually over the degradation of humanity? Are you just going to continue worrying corporately about the declining membership of our churches while waiting on someone else to do something about the polluting power of evil? Are you going to do that? Just tell me so I can know why I came to this conference from such a long distance away. I lost a whole day to get here. So I want to know, what are you going to do? Are you going to leave from here and just be, be happy that you came and, and, and networked with your friends and, and took pictures with, with Dr. Williams, blah, blah, blah? Is that what you're going to do? I need to know before I take flight in the morning. I want to know, are you going to just keep on fretting about the next crisis the devil will create? Are you going to continue being frustrated with the emotions those crises will evoke to dictate what you can or cannot do as a person, as a nation, as a denomination? Well. I think I know what you are going to do. And if I don't know what you're going to do, I absolutely know what you ought to do. And so I say, you can no longer sit on the sidelines as spectators because you are the newly appointed and anointed world changers for God and for this generation. And as Pastor Sam said the other night, what you've been given here these few days, were not, you were not given it to have and to keep and to hold, but you were given it to give away and to share with others. Because freely you have received and freely you must give. I guarantee if you hoard what you've gotten here, it's going to stink on you just like the manna of old stunk on the children of Israel when they hoarded it. You have declared loudly that enough is enough. I was touched by the testimonies of people who stood up and cried out with a loud voice, enough is enough. Now your time has come to mean it, to put up or shut up. From now on, you can live confidently because this week you've been outfitted with the full armor of God to endure hardships like a soldier of the cross. You've been equipped with a variety of implements to toil like a farmer and reap a rich harvest of souls in the heat of the coming days. You've been trained like an Olympic athlete to run a marathon for Jesus and not get weary, knowing that laid up for you is the crown of righteousness which the Lord himself, the righteous judge, will award you and those who love his appearing on that great day when he comes to take us to heaven. So... My challenge, my charge, my advice. You know, Ellen White says, don't give advice because you tamper with people's will. But like the rest of the Adventist church, I don't listen to Ellen White unless it suits me. <laughs> she, she said, don't give advice, but I'm giving you some advice. Run, run world changers, run. 
Run as if your life depended on it because your time has come to confront evil and the terrible toll it's taking on the human family. Your time has come to stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer any more loss. Your time has come to renew your divine commission for the new year. And it's not about losing more weight, getting a bigger house, or a better job. Your divine commission is written in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, which I read a few minutes ago. I want you to think about what Matthew 18 says, especially Matthew 28, especially verse 19. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Did you notice that Jesus didn't say to his disciples, Now Peter, James, and John, I want you to take this motley crew into Jerusalem, into the upper room, and disciple each other. He didn't say that, did he? Because once you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you are a disciple. And it sickens me, it annoys me that my church spends millions of dollars discipling people who are already disciples of Jesus Christ. We have seminars on discipleship which to me is a waste of time. What we need to do is to equip the disciples to go out and make some more disciples because Jesus said, go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. I've repeated this commission to remind you that it's also a co-mission. Get the difference? There's a commission and there's a co-mission. And a co-mission is when we are in partnership with Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. You see, that's his mission and we're co-missionaries with him to seek and save the lost. It's a commission and a co-mission that includes depending on Jesus to overcome evil with good as you make disciples of all people in your sphere of influence. If you have the guts or the grit to accept this co-mission, you must be willing and ready to serve God regardless of the circumstances in which you find yourself in the coming year. This means that if when you encounter opposition, you will have conviction to finish what you start as world changers, ambassadors of Christ, through whom he's making an appeal to the world. If and when others try to persuade you that this mission is impossible, you will trust and obey God, knowing that all things are possible with God. If and when you feel like this mission isn't producing the, the promised results, and you're getting bogged down in a blizzard of blame and despair, you must dig deeper into the Word for more divine instructions, divine instructions such as those preserved for us in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12 and 17. Will you open your Bibles again? Revelation chapter 12. It's the familiar passage. We Adventists love to preach this passage. Sometimes so much so that we miss the message. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Revelation 12. And there was war in heaven, not with bombs and bullets, 
but a debate. The Greek says a debate, a polemic, an argument over words, with words. What words? The Jews call it the Ten Words. We call it the Ten Commandments. They were arguing. Ellen White said that the devil said, this is too hard to keep. And he's convinced the world that it's too hard to keep. He brought that message from the war in heaven, the war that he lost. And I don't know how stupid we humans can be that we respond to the loser more than the winner. He says, Michael and the writer, John, says Michael and his angels waged war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war and they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. World changers, did you hear that? They were not strong enough in heaven, therefore they can't be strong enough on earth when they're confronted by world changers. And the great dragon was thrown down you see the difference? Jesus stepped down. The dragon was flung down. There's a big difference because one who steps down does so in his own power and authority. But one who's flung down is flung down because he's a loser. He was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world he was thrown down on the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. See how many times are you now convinced that they were thrown down and they have no power over you unless you give it to them? Then John said, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come down. For the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before God day and night. I wish I could sing. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. Dance, have a party, for the devil lost and he was thrown down. But it's not over. Woe, woe, woe to the earth. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, boiling rage, knowing that he has only a short time. And verse 17. So the dragon was enraged with the woman, the church, and went off to make war with the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now, did you notice that we overcome the devil and his evil deeds because of the blood of the Lamb. Didn't we just sing that this morning? The blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back there on Calvary, 2,000 plus years, the blood that gives me strength from day to day will never, ever, ever lose its power. And why won't it lose its power? Because Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had, heard it? Sin had left a crimson stain, but he came down and died on the cross and washed it white as snow. We also overcome evil with good because we are among the children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Jesus' testimony, the testimony of Jesus is none other than the word of God. The Bible tells us it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path in a world where men and women love darkness more than light. But I have good news this morning. 
This is why I can preach this morning. Because I know for a fact that the darkness can never, will never overcome the light who is Jesus Christ, the marvelous light. We further overcome evil with good because of the word of their testimony. Whose testimony? Those who were accused by Satan. The brethren who are who have been accused by Satan, but they are the ones who have passed through the fires of persecution and the floods of wickedness in high and low places. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Men and women who didn't love their life. Men like the prophet Jeremiah, whose testimony we find in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. Look with me again to Lamentations. This is a familiar passage to Christians. We all say it, don't we? Great is thy faithfulness, we all say. We all say, morning by morning, new mercies we see. But do we understand where this testimony came from? You know, in 1923, Thomas Chisholm wrote the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And he, when he penned that poem and it was put to music, it became, it, and, and it was published, it became a significant part, song of encouragement in the Christian church. So let's just pause and ponder a moment this familiar stanza. Great is thy faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. You know, this song is not only a favorite that will ring in our subconscious for days to come. It will meddle with our minds for hours after this worship service. Some will cite it in conversation and others will recite it to themselves again and again. But I wonder if we ever consider the context out of which this testimony came. So let's look at the context in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 1 through, through 20. But I'm just going to read a few of the verses in the interest of time and the fact that I really have got a lot to say about it. Lamentations, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Jeremiah shares Israel's afflictions. He said, I am the man who has seen affliction. Have you seen affliction? Because of the rod of God's wrath. He has driven me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely against me he has turned his hand repeatedly all the day long. He has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and encompassed me with bitterness and hardship. Verse 12, he, has, he bent his bow and set me as target for the arrow. He made the arrows of his quiver to enter into my inward parts. I have become a laughing stock to all my people, their mocking song all the day. 
He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drunk with wormwood. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has made me cower in the dust. My soul has been rejected from peace. From peace. I have forgotten happiness. So I say my strength has perished and so has my hope from the Lord. Can you believe this? That the prophet says, I doubt that there's a darker pit in which anyone has fallen in the entire Bible. Maybe Job chapter 3, possibly Jeremiah 20, perhaps Psalm 88 comes close, but few surpasses this Lamentations chapter 3. For it was as if a knife had been plunged into Jeremiah's heart, wringing tears from his eyes as he described the downfall and destruction of his beloved city of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. He felt the horror of evil then as you did after the devastating floods last year or as we did after 9-11 and still do after the massacre in Newtown, Connecticut. The destruction and devastation of Jerusalem wasn't sudden and unexpected as those events that we've gone through. For over 20 years, life in Jerusalem was marred by constant assault upon the sacred city until it finally fell into the hands of its Babylonian enemies. And although the prophet wrote this lament some 10 years after that historic event, they were as raw to him as if it happened the day he penned this poignant poem. Events that he saw, such as the bloody massacre and massive destruction of property, especially the temple they called the dwelling place of God and one of the wonders of the world. Most of the catastrophes in our world occur at a distance far away from us, we only see it on television and we pause a moment and then go on with our lives. But to Jeremiah, it was very present and, and, and personal. So just imagine what it must be like if while we're here under this tent that has been sanctified for these events, just imagine if while we are here under this tent worshiping the Lord, a gunman walks in and begins shooting children first. And I'm sure you never consider what bullets do to children. You see, their bodies are soft and supple. And when the bullet hits them, where it only tears or flesh, it scatters theirs. So I want you to have a vivid imagination if this gunman walks in and starts shooting the children first. You instinctively dive under your chair to take cover. And you see his feet and hear his, his heavy, evil breathing as screams of little children mingled with rapid sounds of streams of bullets ring out over the loudspeaker as they are being slaughtered one after the other. And you are hiding under your chair, frozen with fear, and can do nothing to stop the evil and save the children. I shudder to even just think about it. I know some of you, you're used to love, love, love. So you don't want to hear the harshness of evil and the pervasive, the, the, the pernicious elements of sin. I shudder just to think of it. But Jeremiah lived through worse terrors. He watched barbaric Babylonians line up the pregnant women in his village, the Hebrew women, perhaps even his own sisters, and slit their stomachs open as bloodthirsty invaders cast lots to see how long the fetus would survive while the mother bleeds slowly to death. Imagine seeing that. He saw 
blood run like rivers through the streets of his native land. He lived through the plaintive screams of helpless victims and watched unspeakable atrocities he later described in this one of five poems that bear all of the marks of one of an eyewitness of these events. It might surprise you to know that in all scripture, there is perhaps no greater contrast between destruction of a people and expressions of delight in the Lord than in Lamentations chapter 3. By the way, did you know that Lamentations wasn't the original name for this book of poems? The original name in the Hebrew was Acha, and that word means how. But it was named Lamentations when the Greek scholars, Greek translators after the Babylonian exile, couldn't find a word in their lexicon to describe and convey the full meaning of Acha, the Hebrew word that means how. You see, Acha, or how, is the first word in chapters 1, 2, and 4 of Lamentations. And the Jews named the books of the Bible based on the first word that appears in that text. And so they named Lamentations Acha, and that is the name that appears in all Hebrew Bibles to this day. Acha conveys a sense of profound shock after indescribable loss, such as the destruction of Jerusalem. Acha begs for answers to questions such as these. How in God's earth did this happen? You ever ask yourself a question like that? How in the world could this atrocity have taken place? How could God have allowed the vicious slaughter of thousands of people who faithfully worshipped him? How could he have silently watched the brut brutally savaged women and mothers who were reduced to eating their own children to survive? How could he have allowed the cream of the crop of Judah like Daniel and his three friends to be taken and marched for days and miles to be captives in the, in the profane city of Babylon. How could this have happened in Jerusalem, a place whose name means reign of peace or foundation of peace and called the holy city, the dwelling place of God? How on earth could this have happened? And if that wasn't bad enough, their temple was destroyed and the people who were left behind couldn't worship anymore. How? How could this have happened? But there was worse to come when the weeping prophet discovered that it wasn't just the brutal Babylonians who did this, these atrocities. It wasn't just Nebuchadnezzar and his nasty horde of raiders who were to blame for this disaster. It was God himself. It was God himself who did all of these terrible things according to Jeremiah in his Lamentations. Let me show you in Lamentations chapter 1 verses 12 through 14. I hope you're hanging with me and, and, and listening. I'm the kind of preacher that likes to give the fullness of this story before we draw lessons. So I hope I'm not boring you to tears. Nod if you're with me. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. You're not asleep out there, are you? Those who are watching, hang with me. I've got a point that I'm moving toward. But listen to chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Is it nothing to all you who pass this way? Look and see if there is any pain like my pain, which was severely dealt out to me 
which the Lord himself inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire into my bones, and it prevailed over them. He has spread a net for my feet. He has turned me back. He has made me desolate, faint all day long. The yoke of my transgressions is bound. By his hand they are knit together. They have come upon my neck. He himself has made my strength fail. The Lord himself has given me into the hands of those against whom I am not able to stand. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? How? You know, it's one thing when you're doing something grand for God to look at trials and tribulations and to say the devil is on my back. He's trying to deter me. It's one thing to experience a disaster and know that the enemy has done this or that evil in the world. It's one thing to pray like Daniel and discover later that the Lord sent an angel an answer by an angel, but the prince of darkness withstood him for 21 days. But it's quite another thing, especially for us who believe in the sovereignty of God, who keep his commandments and cherish his word, to accept that God deliberately caused the accident, the heart attack, the cancer that took the life of a loved one. It's quite another thing to think that when you are out there sacrificing your life as a world changer and witnessing for God, he would break your teeth with gravel or make you a laughing stock in the world he sent you to change. It's quite another thing to admit that God caused the massacre that took the lives of harmless adults and innocent ch children. Let me quickly affirm that while God doesn't hold the guns and spray the victims with bullets, if he doesn't intervene but allows the terrible tragedy to take place, according to the testimony of Jeremiah and other speakers, writers in the Bible, according to the Bible, it is God himself who does it. We don't like to hear that. He himself did it. The prophet further asserts that God did those atrocious things to his own people to wake them up, to call the nation immersed in evil in a culture of gross immorality and vicious violence to wake up. A culture of violence like America has become. Once called the little lamb is now one of the most violent cultures in the earth and it's polluting other cultures and Australia isn't too far behind where today God is allowing unspeakable acts of wickedness to jar us awake, to confront us with the corrupting influence of evil, to show us that the nation, that this nation, is, has become the puppet of the dragon, polluting our church and our world with wickedness and giving the devil reason to boast that everything is going his way. Why am I telling you all this? It's because God does and will continue to, to show and to allow treacherous acts of evil, some of them worse than we've already witnessed. Do you believe that? There are worse things to come than we've already witnessed. Until we wake up from our spiritual stupor and totally trust and obey God. I know to say that God does these evil, atrocious things, to admit or accept this idea is theologically worse to some than the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day that cause unin unimaginable random acts of evil. But to deny 
that God does this is to miss the message for our time, is to miss the revelation of God that our time has come to wake up and stand firm against the encroaching evil of our day. Make no mistake, my friends. Make no mistake, my fellow world changers. The increasing aggressiveness of demons today is only a sign of things more wicked this way comes. Things so awful that we can't even imagine them to enslave our denomination and our nation. So let's learn more from the prophet who overcame the evil done by and to his nation and generation according to his testimony in Lamentations 3, 22 and 24 to 24. In the midst of all the mayhem mentioned in the previous chapters and verses, memories of which Jeremiah, which brought Jeremiah to the dark door of despair and caused him to be forever labeled as the weeping prophet. This is what his testimony is saying to us today. I believe his testimony is saying, I'm reeling from the raw results of decades of incredible tribulations. I'm reeling from the raw results of wicked invaders who have robbed me of my family, taken the life and liberty of my people, raped our promised land, and ruined our sacred temple. But I will not let them take away my joy in the Lord, for I was divinely appointed and anointed as a world changer. So while my heart is breaking from the results of unspeakable disaster, I have deliberately, without malice or forethought, forced, made myself recall the faithfulness, the steadfastness, the immovability, the trustworthiness, the dependability of my God. And why? Because that's what true believers do when the wind, when the devil knocks the wind out of them. When the rubber meets the road and the ride is rougher than you anticipated. When the devil drives a nail through your heart to kill Christ in you. Even though you have been hurt and you don't like what it feels. You make yourself. You force yourself. You deliberately make yourself remember the times when you sat in this tent and raised your hand and praised the Lord and you think of the faithfulness of God. You see, this gave Jeremiah hope. And it will give you world changers hope. Your time has come to go boldly into the new year and make disciples of all nations by the word of your testimony. But before you go, you've got to make sure to clean up your own act and your own house and take care of some personal matters. For instance, to my embarrassment, it has been found that some among us world changers are secretly wallowing in sin, in the sin of pornography, sexual misconduct, and several forms of gross immorality like gossiping and cheating God out of his time and tithe and talents. You know, the Apostle Paul said, these things and other such ungodly things should not even be named much more practiced among the people who are called world changers by God's name. Yet, they are. Let's just be upfront and admit that we're not all saints, but we're all sinners saved by grace. In fact, 
it never ceases to amaze me how long some of us will, will stay in places of emotional, physical, financial, and even moral degradation due to unconfessed sin in our lives. Some are unwilling and others are unable to move, to move out of those situations because they feel stuck. But I'm here this morning to testify as one who has overcome and is still overcoming because I'm a work in progress. I've overcome some of the most hateful acts and attitudes against God. And I'm here to tell you that it is your choice. It is your choice, world changers. You don't have to continue living in sin and being oppressed by sin anymore. For when God chose you to be a world changer, the son of righteousness liberated you from sin, from all of those things. Not some, but all of them. All of that, all of the claims that sin and the devil has put upon you. And when the son has set you free, you are free indeed. Therefore, even when it appears as if matters are beyond your control, you still have options. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have options? You can decide how long you're going to stay in a place of immorality. You can decide how quickly you're going to get out. But sometimes we prefer the pain we know than the freedom and liberty we don't know. So how long will you stay in that place? You can decide how long you're going to allow people to take advantage of you of your kindness and your weakness. You can decide right now whether or not you're going to remain in financial or emotional bondage with limited discretionary resources or get out right now so that God can bless you and use you as a blessing to others. I'm here to encourage you to not stay there. You must get out. But when and if you decide to move up and move out with Jesus, you will encounter opposition. Even the very members of the church that you're returning to, even some of those who rode with you on the buses and on the planes might ridicule you. And they will do this to draw you off course. You might even be ridiculed and rejected, but don't let those challenges draw you off your course. Don't let the devil dim your light and don't let the detractors steal your crown. Instead, stand firm knowing that as Jesus once prayed for Peter on earth, he is now at the right hand of God praying for you in heaven, interceding for you. Stand firm, confident that Jesus is with you always, even to the end of the age. Stand firm, not under duress, but joyfully, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. For it is written in 1 Peter 5 verse 4, that when the shepherd, the chief shepherd comes, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So, it seems like the heat is getting to you, and I'm coming near to the end. So turn to somebody and say, stand firm. <laughs> say it again, stand firm. <laughs> say it again, stand firm. <laughs> you see, your time has come, world changers to lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles so that you can run with endurance the race that is set before you and help others overcome evil with the word of your testimony. And the way that you overcome evil 
and have confidence in the testimony of, 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 of the prophet Jeremiah is to consider the companions of God's great faithfulness. Have you ever thought about this? It says, great is your faithfulness. And then there are two companions that Jeremiah mentioned in the plural form because you can't adequately express or describe such multidimensional, vast and boundless companions of a great faithfulness in the singular. The first is loving kindnesses. Not just loving kindness, but loving kindnesses, also known as steadfast or great love. They never cease. These loving kindnesses describe God's beauty, mercy, and grace, without which there would be no repentance from sin. They are so magnanimous that Jeremiah used the plural to demonstrate the generosity with which God lavishes our, ever, our everlasting, ever-loving Heavenly Father, lavishes us with His unconditional regard. Compassions. The second companion, they're also in the plural, which mean, and they mean mercies. These, these compassions are best described by a godly mother's love for her child. Notice I didn't say a mother's love, but a godly mother's love for her children. They never fail. Compassions, is, they are deep, the deep awareness of the suffering of others. They are the, the, the prayers that we make for strength to relieve the pain of others. And even if we can't relieve them, we know that our powerful God has the ability to relieve and remove the suffering. And so we pray and we work to change the world. And we do so, not in the singular form, but in the plural. You see, loving kindnesses and compassions were there for Jeremiah to find hope and relief from his afflictions. And Thomas Chisholm caught this, caught onto this when he wrote his hymn and added this final verse. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 besides. You know the words. Great is his faithfulness. Great is his faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All we have needed, his hands have provided. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, unto me. Don't be like those who've lost the art of living one day at a time. You know the type who can't see the glory of the present sunshine for bitterness over past pain, a fear of present anxieties and future heavy clouds their sure will come, fear of the unknown, worry about what lies ahead. All of these prevent us from seeing and accepting the present loving kindnesses and compassions of God's great faithfulness. I know what that feels like. You see, years ago, when I graduated from college with my bachelor's degree in theology, the only job that I could get, the only job that God provided for me was to be a gopher, the lowest on the totem pole at the general conference. And at the general conference in those days, they did not consider women studying for the ministry to be a viable option. Some of the leaders were very quick to tell me that I'm wasting my time. And I want you to know that 
as they talked down to me and as I ran like a, like a rat in a cage from office to office, bringing papers, going to make copies, doing these little menial tasks, I was angry with God. I said to God, after all that I sacrificed, I gave up a good job. I spent, I borrowed money to pay for my education. I studied hard. I paid attention to what the teachers were telling me to prepare me for ministry. And this is the best you can do for me? How? How on earth can you treat me like this? I said to God. And I was angry with God. For months as I worked at the general conference, I got angrier and angrier with God. And eventually I said to myself, I need to quit this business and go get a good job. And I missed the opportunity and the reason why God placed me there at the general conference as a gopher. You see, I wasn't born in a Christian family. I wasn't raised a Seventh-day Adventist. And God placed me to work with the president of the denomination, the vice president, and the secretaries, and all of the big names you can know. And they knew me by name. And while I was hating God, I missed the opportunity to realize that one day, one day, one day God was going to open the door of ministry for me and I would be able to look those men in the eyes and say to them, I am called by God and anointed by him and you've seen me and my testimony. So world changers, don't get upset if God doesn't call you to preach the sermon next Sabbath. Don't be upset if the conference president doesn't call you and say, I heard you were there and I have a job for you. Don't be upset if God puts you into, into a, a place that is, is just so, so puny, so beneath your dignity. Because God has a plan to lift you up, to elevate you. You know, I learned much later in my life. I learned much later in my walk with Jesus. And I won't ever forget that God sometimes allows appointed, anointed world changers to experience suffering as he did the Apostle Paul. Let me share with you what he did to the Apostle Paul in case you've forgotten. In 2 Corinthians, I'm coming close. I'm driving home. I can see the signs that says, land the plane. <laughs> I'm coming. Hang with me, babe. I'm a coming. You remember in 2 Corinthians, Chapter 12, verse 7. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote that world changers must remember. He said, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that God was going to give him in his life, for this reason, to keep Hyveth Williams from exalting herself, God placed her as a gopher, as the lowest on the totem pole at the general conference. Paul said, God placed him as the lowest. There was given to me, he said, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. And concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. But the Lord said to me three times and many more, My grace is sufficient for you. My sisters and brothers in Christ, our time has come to tell Satan 
that we're not going to let him take advantage of us anymore. Your time has come to make a decision to bust a move. And I seen you bust a move when that reggae saw you, pastor, bust a move to the glory of God. Your time has come to bust a move to the glory of God and give some indication that you're no longer going to passively take what the devil dishes out. After all, you are world changers, part of the fellowship of the unashamed, and we cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, diluted, or delayed. We will not flinch in the face of criticism. We will not hesitate in the presence of adversity. We will not negotiate at the table of the enemy or ponder at the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity that's prepared by the devil and his evil angels to entrap us. We won't give up, shut up, or let up until we've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, and spoken up for Jesus Christ and his cause. Your time. Your time has come to step up and get your minds and hearts pure and your hands busy for the sake of your call in Jesus Christ. Your time has come to live your faith out loud, to give until you drop, to testify until all know, to work until Jesus stops you. And when he comes for his own, you will be recognized as those who overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the testimony of Jesus. Why? Because you are world changers. Who are you? World now, who are you? World now, who are you? World changers. And we have the power to change the world.